Hi, everyone. We're so glad to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nana Khanna, she or they pronouns. I'm the co-executive director of Positive Women's Network USA, also a proud member of the US People Living with HIV Caucus. Um, I also serve on the steering committee of HIV Racial Justice Now and as a board member of AIDS United. And I'm really grateful to have all of you joining us today for this session. Um, all eyes on us, what everyone needs to know about molecular HIV surveillance. And this session is being sponsored by the US People Living with HIV Caucus, which will be I think perhaps introduced in a little more detail later, um, the caucus is basically a network of networks of people living with HIV. And we have um, a really fierce and exciting lineup for you today. I'm just gonna be your friendly session moderator. We have a lot of um, really incredible experts on with us today and um, a, a bunch of different panelists. And as they cover their portions, they're gonna introduce themselves in a little more detail themselves. Um, but I'll just give you a little bit of a sense of who's going to be with us in the room today. And we're really looking forward to hearing a lot from each of you who are here. Um, also, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that we're in a moment where there's a lot going on in the world. And it's um, it's a heavy moment for a lot of us here. And I just want to like send some love and vibes to everybody. Um, you know, the, the violence that is impacting our communities and um, the ways that many different forms of violence are just like structured by white supremacy and patriarchy, um, I know are a lot. Um, for um, many of us are still reeling from what happened in Atlanta, the anti-Asian violence um, last week, which was not new. Um, you know, in fact, it's been going on for a long time. Um, Atlanta was just a culmination of a lot of what's already been happening in many communities. And then yesterday, um, in Colorado, we had, um, you know, I think we all saw there was another really um, terrible mass shooting and some of us, um, especially brown people were on edge all night and this morning waiting for the name of the shooter to get announced. Um, because we know what it means when the name of the shooter gets announced and it's a brown person or a Muslim person, what it means for our communities. So I just want to acknowledge that a lot of us are sitting with a lot today. Um, coming into this conversation. And in some ways that's very relevant to the context of the conversation we're having about how communities are, you know, read differently, policed differently, surveilled differently, violence in communities is interpreted differently um, based on who we are. And so I'm gonna spray a little bit of my aura cleanser right here and invite everybody to take a deep breath and, um, be with us in this moment around this, this conversation about how we really honor and protect communities that are extremely vulnerable in many different ways. Um, thank you so much. So the goals of our session today are, um, we want to create a space where folks can understand, first of all, what molecular HIV surveillance is and the status of MHS rollout in our communities. Um, we also want to have some discussion about emerging concerns related to molecular HIV surveillance. And if I'm saying these words, molecular HIV surveillance, and you really don't know exactly what they are, don't worry, we're going to talk about that. We're going to break it all down. Um, it's, it's a little bit confusing, um, but it's basically, um, it, it is a tool that is being used that we are going to discuss. Um, we also want to hear from you all our participants about your perspectives on this um, technology or tool that's being used, molecular HIV surveillance. And we also wanna leave you with some concrete next steps you can take to figure out what's going on in your own jurisdiction around molecular HIV surveillance and actions you might wanna take about that. Um, and so here's the flow of our session today. We'll do a bit of an intro. What is MHS in the first place? We'll hear from an amazing panel about emerging concerns and human rights issues. Then we'll get into a conversation about what we can do, including a discussion, and then we'll have a closing. Um, and so as far as logistics, um, for now, we're asking folks to stay on mute. Please do put any questions, comments, thoughts, brilliant ideas you have in the chat box. We wanna hear them throughout. We know that our community is brilliant. Um, you all already always have the answers to the questions. So, um, share them with us and feel free to drop them in the chat. And then we'll also have time for folks to come off mute later. Um, here is our presenter lineup. And 
whoa, <laughs> look at all these people. Um, I am so impressed by this panel. I'm so excited to hear from each of them. So we have, we're going to be hearing from Andrew Spieldenner, um, the Executive Director of Im Impact Global Action for Gay Men's Health and Rights. Um, we're also going to be hearing from Barb Cardell, the Training Director at Positive Women's Network, Larry Scott Walker, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Thrive SS, Cecilia Chung, the founder of Positively Trans, um, also Senior Director at Transgender Law Center, Marco Castro Bajorquez, uh, co-chair of HIV Racial Justice Now, Ebony Turk, National Field Organizer for Positive Women's Network, Brian Manalga, the project manager at the Legacy Project, and Benjamin Brooks, Assistant Director of Policy at Whitman Walker Institute. And um, each of them will say perhaps a little bit more about themselves as they introduce their sections, um, but you are um, in for a treat. These are a bunch of brilliant folks with lots of powerful perspectives for us. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn this first section over to um, Andy and Barb to guide us through some of the basics of what molecular HIV surveillance is. Thanks, Nana. Um, welcome, everybody. I should also point out that I'm the vice chair of the US People Living with HIV Caucus. And most of you, if you've been at AIDS Watch the last few years, um, have been involved in planning it. Um, and of course, we have to thank Nana Khanna, the executive, uh, co-executive director of Positive Women's Network for such an amazing introduction and lineup and helping us get organized. So thank you all for coming. Um, Barb, did you want to say anything about yourself first? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, Barb Cardell, I'm the training director for PWN. I use they, them, their pronouns, and I am an emeritus member of the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. So glad to be here with everyone today. Cool. So we're going to explain some of the basics of molecular HIV surveillance. Um, next slide. And just to contextualize it, surveillance has always been a tool that's been used to intervene in people's lives for the public good. And of course, who's considered part of the public is part of the problem, um, because some people are protected and some people are not. In very early surveillance laws, um, for instance, there's always been a caveat. Syphilis was one of the first uh, health conditions in which we uh, use surveillance codes and policies and laws in the United States. And even in this first surveillance laws, it indicated that sex workers did not deserve privacy, whereas um, uh, uh, particularly female sex workers did not uh, deserve privacy, whereas the clients, the male clients of the sex workers, the Johns, um, had to be protected. Um, their identities had to be protected. So even in early laws, we see that some some lives are considered worthy of privacy and some are not. Now, public health surveillance does, uh, in HIV, we use it a lot to direct resources to the community's hardest hit. And most of us who work in the field have heard, we get very, very uh, public health jargony. So we, we know what zero prevalence is and we know what zero incidence is and we know all of these surveillance, um, contact tracing, all this language about it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and it can be very useful, but it, there's also some challenges to it. And um, one of them is uh, determining who has the right to privacy, who has the right, uh, who is part of the public that's being protected. And are we as people living with HIV part of that public being protected? Next slide. I can't advance. Okay. And when we had the national HIV AIDS strategy, um, you saw that uh, molecular HIV surveillance, actually surveillance was considered one of the pillars and still is, and we'll get back to that. But in terms of how it actually works, what's different about molecular HIV surveillance to other surveillance systems in HIV, I'm going to turn it over to Barb. Next slide. Great. Thank you, Andy. So we wanted to go ahead and just talk about exactly how data is collected and why when we're talking about molecular HIV surveillance, it is it is so problematic um, because it often sounds like this very interesting science that people are having an opportunity to learn very interesting things about HIV transmission. And it sounds very cool and kind of almost Star Trek-y. But when we step back, we really kind of think about how molecular HIV surveillance is collected. Um, it becomes problematic, um, and, and it really highlights how, in many ways, people living with HIV have lost control of um, data that is impacting their lives. 
So we start off with people living with HIV, and really what we need to say is that we don't just start off with people living with HIV. We start off with people who are newly diagnosed with HIV, who are going to a medical doctor for the first time to try and um, understand both HIV as well as to um, be prescribed medications to be healthy and to live long lives with HIV. Um, so the data that is collected starts from a drug resistance test um, that a, a medical provider needs before they can actually go ahead and prescribe medication to someone newly diagnosed. And this uh, is, is actually a medical test that has been done to be able to learn about resistance profiles. And, um, and it is done in a doctor's office. And so we see that we have people living with HIV and we move to provider orders and HIV drug resistance tests. So this is in partnership with the person living with HIV and their medical provider. And here's where we have the first challenge, which is that often at this point in time, the person living with HIV might not be aware that this test um, is going to be shared beyond their medical provider and the decisions that they are making around access to medications. Um, by law in many, in most states actually, um, once this resistance is, uh, profile is done, when it's sent off to the lab, they go ahead and do the genetic sequencing, the resistance report goes back to the doctor and the doctor and the person living with HIV can make determinations about what is the best choice for HIV medication. The part that often is not shared with the person living with HIV, or if it is shared, it is often part of a whole overwhelming amount of information um, is that the HIV sec uh, sequence is sent to the state health department as well and is kept in a, a data bank and, and, is, and is held on to there. Um, and, and that genetic profile is of the HIV virus, not of the person. But as we later will learn, this still is very problematic because the HIV sequence is sent to the state and local health department. It is part of EHARS, which is the electronic health records system. Um, it is at that point in time then sent on to the CDC after people's names are stripped out of it. And um, as they are able to, at the CDC, compare all of the data that is collected for people living with HIV and their data sequences for their virus um, across the entire United States, they are now able to do some pretty exciting mapping and um, able to tell clusters about whose virus is related to someone else and they are able to use this information that I just wanna remind everybody comes originally from a visit from somebody living with HIV in a doctor's office, having a test about their HIV medication this data that has been extracted can now be used to map onto a cluster that then talks about whether or not someone's HIV um, virus and the, the sequencing is similar to someone else's. Um, and that is how we have these cluster detections, at which point in time the CDC will go ahead and send this information back to the health departments that they have a cluster that is detected. Um, it is concerning because if the cluster is detected in multiple states, this information will be sent to multiple states. And um, while your state might be uh, pretty okay or safe around, especially HIV criminalization, often it will be shared in a state that is not. And so, you know, really when we talk about it, when we talk about our information being shared, we need to go ahead and know that this is a public health use of an individual treatment and, and a protocol, and that that is always very, very concerning. So that is how the whole thing happens, and it is uh, bounced back and forth between the CDC and the state health department, and um, at which point in time, if there is a cluster detection, then that is where we start with the um, prevention interventions, and that is when people with the disease intervention specialists we'll start going out and we'll start to um, gather information from people that are in these clusters back at the state level. So I wanna just let people know that at the CDC level, it is de-identified, your name is not associated, but back at the state level, it is indeed associated with your name and your information. So next slide, please. 
So when we talk about molecular HIV surveillance being used, you know, uh, molecular HIV surveillance actually exists in many countries, but we want to talk about data sharing laws and privacy protections and community engagement and how it is very, very different. And we always need to talk about HIV criminalization, especially in the United States. We are one of the countries that criminalizes people living with HIV uh, more than most other countries. And so any genetic data, any connection to transmission um, is important for us to acknowledge. And as of January 1st, 2018, PS 181802 um, mandates that all state health departments must support reporting and monitoring of this uh, phylogenetic analysis, which is the molecular HIV surveillance to receive funding. And so um, one of the questions we get when we do this presentation is, Molecular HIV surveillance something that happens in my state? And the answer is yes, it happens in every state and every territory in the United States that is accessing this funding. Next slide. So when we talk about molecular HIV surveillance and why it's met with community resistance, there are a number of reasons. Um, we outlined a couple of them as I was going over the slide. And the first is the lack of informed consent and knowledge by people living with HIV about how this information that is being gathered in the medical office for a uh, the medical support is, is being used. There's also the surveillance and policing, which happens disproportionately at, in some communities and at some communities. And a lot of them, the uh, what Barb described is a utopian view of how molecular HIV surveillance works. And on the ground, it actually is, a, is an intervention, and we'll talk about why that can be problematic, especially since most of the people that are identified in clusters are already marginalized and vulnerable um, in society, and we'll talk about that. Another way that um, we have not been consulted is that there has not been a lot of community involvement and engagement in how molecular HIV surveillance has been rolled out. It was um, rolled out in a couple of test uh, states, 17 test states in 2013, and in 2018, it rolled out across the entire United States. Um, and it did not have meaningful involvement of people living with HIV. You're able to share our concerns about how our data was collected, how it was being used, or how people who were in these clusters are being contacted to gather information for this public health good. And remember that data protection and data sharing varies from state to state. Um, this, this is a federal program, but it's being implemented locally. And it's one of those complicated places where the CDC has oversight over how it's implemented, but every state has different um, uh, autonomy around how they implement and how they share data. When we are talking about any information that is being gathered about people living with HIV, especially anything that can map onto transmissions, we must always come back to the risk of HIV criminalization, um, whether or not this information is able to be shared with law enforcement, and especially around disclosure and safety issues. And when we talk about uh, those safety issues, they also involve the public health workforce. We're going to specifically address that in a few minutes. And then finally, is it even cost effective? Um, there, there are still a lot of concerns about whether or not this information is even useful in being able to um, be used as a prevention tool to identify communities that need more resources um, or if it is actually effective at accomplishing what they are hoping to do. Next slide. So criminalization we've touched on. Most of the people at Age Watch, I'm hoping that you've heard HIV criminalization before you've heard of it. Um, but if you haven't, um, there are still over 30 states in the US that criminalize people living with HIV um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of them is non-disclosure during sex, but it's also drug using. There's lots of, every state is different. And so every state that has these kinds of laws have very different, um, have very different uh, legal you know, there are very different activities involved in this law. So in some laws, it's spitting is still considered um, part of HIV criminalization. And, and transmission is never part of these um, cases. And they can just, they destroy our lives as people living with HIV because 
you know, if somebody accuses, and it's usually a he said, he said, you know, she said, he said type situation. And, um, you know, to prove that you knew your HIV status, they involved the health department to come in and verify that you indeed um, received an HIV positive diagnosis. So, um, you know, these, these laws are used primarily against uh, people of color, um, sex workers, uh, people of trans experience. Um, so, you know, these are used to amplify, um, uh, uh, amplify, uh, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? A prosecution, sorry, amplify prosecutions often. And so um, people take the, the plea out, even though it will mark them as a sex, a, a, um, um, a sex criminal for the rest of their lives. And one of the challenges with uh, these laws and why MHS becomes really uh, important is while the current technology does not uh, prove directionality, um, it could, and with recency assay, with being another technology being rolled out, these things could be put together by prosecution. But the other thing is that often these, um, these cases aren't actually disproven on science. So many of these cases go to court and, or trial, or they're, and they're not ever, science is never really introduced. And it's up to the person actually um, to defending themselves, right? If I'm a person with HIV that's been accused of it, it's up to me to hire an expert epidemiologist to defend me um, if I'm implicated in somebody's HIV diagnosis. Um, and I don't, I, I may not have the money for that. Um, hiring experts is expensive. Um, and the other problem with criminalization, and we bring it up, is because, because the knowledge of your HIV status is required for you to be prosecuted, then what if people choose not to get tested because they can then be prosecuted? So it creates a barrier to care um, and testing, which allegedly public health doesn't want to do. Next slide. So, you know, people say, oh, could MHS be actually used in criminalization cases to prove it? And it has been. <laughs> um, there's a case in Canada where it was proven, um, uh, you know, and, and we see that, uh, you know, this was data that was pulled from um, the Los Alamo lab, which is in the U.S., um, which holds the data. Um, next slide. And... Uh, NASDAQ has a great, uh, NASDAQ is the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors, and they looked at, they looked at HIV data policy and confidentiality, and they noted that um, every region is different. Every region has different, um, different protections and different powers, and uh, often, as long as they can justify the public health need, they can share data. Um, and so some, st some states refuse to do it. So there are some states that have very strict controls over who can access the data and some, some not, not as strict. Um, next slide. So when we're also talking about molecular HIV surveillance, we also need to be talking about stigma, um, both institutional stigma as well as internalized stigma. And, and I love this, I, I love this because we are not clusters, which is that example on the right. That is what an actual um, cluster would look like around uh, HIV uh, mapping. And instead we are people um, and we must refuse. And this is part of the reason why this presentation is so important is to start us talking again about why it is so important for us to refuse to allow uh, the government that is saying that they are gathering this information and mapping these on for public good when we need to start asking who's public good and why is the misuse of our medical information um, part of the public good. Uh, we also need to really start thinking about our own internalized stigma. Um, the most heartbreaking part of talking about molecular HIV surveillance is people living with HIV who believe that it is okay for their information to be used without their consent because they're living with HIV, they must have done something wrong. And I really feel like we need to also talk about the internalized stigma that allows us um, to believe that we are um, not worthy of having our information protected and having consent about how our information is used. Next slide. And the stigma is involved in the messaging. So we've seen already, this is media coverage of clusters, um, you know, people living with HIV, you know, clusters are people, not, not something else. 
Um, and this is what, so we see North Seattle HIV cluster among drug users and homeless people worries health officials. In this notice, they actually identified part of the city where these people lived or were homeless in. And so we kind of marked that as like, you know, that's a troubling message. Um, and transgender women in Los Angeles are more likely to be in high in HIV incidence clusters than any other group. And um, my colleagues will talk about some of the problematic messaging and why that becomes problematic. Next slide. When we talk about the public health workforce, we're talking about training people in the public health departments on new science, new technologies, um, cultural competence. And what we've seen is that often health departments haven't resourced community engagement in any meaningful way. There's, you know, there's a handful of people they go to every time to represent the entire community. And we really want to trouble that idea of community engagement. In addition, you know, it requires an investment in policy and in, in service training to get people trained up on what does new technology mean? What does science mean? We've seen a lot of health departments sign on to U equals U, for instance, but they haven't changed their messaging around whether we as people living, living with HIV can have meaningful, powerful sex lives and whether we deserve it. Next slide. Molecular HIV surveillance is not new. It's been around since 2013. And why are we talking about it now? Next slide. Because when we talk about the ending the HIV epidemic, it is a cornerstone to this plan. And we really need to make sure that when we are providing community input and reviewing the ending the HIV epidemic plan in our jurisdiction, that we are pushing back around molecular HIV surveillance. Um, that we, as we see, this is the fourth corner of the fourth pillar. We want to make sure that we are uh, talking about informed consent and that people are aware that their data is being shared and that there are strong, strict data protections in place. Next slide. Turn it over to Brian. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that excellent introduction from Andy and Barb. That makes my job here easy. Um, I'm going to do my best to stick to my five minutes. Oh my gosh, and my computer's about to die. Um, stall for just a second. I need to go grab my adapter. I just got the, uh, cool. the notice. No worries, we got this. Um, so thank you, thank you, Andy and Barb, so much. So just quickly summarizing what we heard. Um, MHS is happening everywhere, whether you've heard of it or not. If you are a person living with HIV who has had blood work done, um, most likely your genomic sequence data is already in the system, right? Um, and so I think Brian's gonna talk to us about some of the concerns that are emerging now. Okay, great, thank you. So we can go to the next slide and I'll do my best. I only have three slides, so I'm gonna see if I can do this. Um, so my main point here that I want, uh, that I think we should all be aware of is what Andy and Barb have just told us is the beginnings of MHS and how MHS is currently being implemented. But what I've come to realize is it's not contained to what we've heard already. Um, MHS continues to evolve and it's growing and being used in new ways. So there's a future to MHS as well. Um, as we've already heard from Andy um, and from Barb, MHS is now the fourth pillar of the ending the HIV epidemic. So we're not relying on existing public health measures to end the epidemic. We're now utilizing this new technology and it's um, all the way at the federal level being described as a pillar, one of four pillars to end the HIV epidemic. We've also heard a little bit about this discussion of direct transmission versus direction of transmission. So this is when we're trying to identify and uh, determine can this technology really determine if person A transmitted HIV to person B? And the narrative around this is also evolving. Uh, right now, we're hearing that the technology is not sophisticated enough to actually make that determination, person A to person B. But when you combine um, the phylogenetic data with um, contextual data, with demographic data, with uh, stories, with bias in courtrooms, for example, all of that can lead to a, um, an inference of person A transmitting to person B. And there are phylogeneticists, the people who actually use this technology, who are in disagreement about this point. There are some who actually say the technology right now 
is sophisticated enough to determine person A transmitted to person B. So keep your eye on this discussion on direct transmission, another area where this is evolving. And then this last area um, is, I think, what folks really wanted me to talk about today, which is some emerging concerns in the area of academic and public health research using molecular HIV surveillance data. So um, there's this, this is something I became aware of in my own community here in Seattle. And I'm working in close collaboration with some of our, um, our partners who I know are with us today on the call as well from the, the health department here in public health, Seattle King County. And they've explained that there's this new uh, use of MHS using what they're calling probabilistic phylodynamic methods. So that's a mouthful, but basically what this means is they're trying to estimate transmission patterns using the um, genetic data they have in conjunction with the de-identified information that we have about people existing in these HIV clusters. So basically, if you look here at the bottom where I'm, I'm talking about age, race, and ethnicity, what they're trying to do with this new model is to look at the dynamics between what we're calling or what they're calling the transmitting partner and the receiving partner. And they're looking at this in terms of um, age, race, and ethnicity. So for example, um, you know, what if you are of a certain age group, and you have a sex partner who's of your same age group or another age group, what is the probability that you could acquire HIV from that person or transmit HIV to that person? And they're looking at that in these three categories, age, race, and ethnicity. So we know uh, based on um, the kind of bias in our society and inequities in our society, that this is a really tricky area, especially when we're looking at issues of race and ethnicity and uh, thinking about what is the likelihood of transmission based on those categories. So let's go to the next slide. So I just wanted to really briefly put a framework up for us to think about. Um, we could talk about this for a really long time, but I've adapted this from um, a paper from some of my favorite authors. I put the citation at the bottom of the page there. And this is originally focused on health inequities for transgender people but I've adapted it for us to think a little bit more um, about health justice overall and an anti-oppressive systems framework, as I'm calling it. So you can see here, there, there are these layers of systems and processes. So we have systems of domination, including things like white supremacy, capitalism, colonialism. We also have institutional systems, such as our public health systems, our systems of care, uh, where we know, for example, from the 2015 United States Transgender Survey that us transgender people are going in to receive care and instead we're getting physically assaulted, sexually assaulted, um, harassed, we're getting refused care. We also know from our institutions that people who need PrEP, for example, um, the most, particularly when we're talking about communities of color, Black um, people, um, men who have sex with men, are also being refused PrEP because the providers think they will abuse PrEP and take more risks. So our institutional systems are another layer of oppression. And then we also have sociocultural processes and all of these layers together are actually what is responsible for creating what we all know as health inequities. So too often, I think we look at these inequities and disparities in the data and we say, oh, trans people have such a high rate of HIV. What are they doing wrong? Or, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, they're not engaged in care. What is wrong with them? Why aren't they going to the doctor? When really, when we look at an anti-oppressive framework and the systems, we realize that it's these layers of domination and oppression that are creating these inequities. It's not the fault and the responsibility of these individuals from disenfranchised communities. So what this model purports is that we need to name the power relations, disrupt these systems and the status quo, and center the embodied knowledge to move more toward health justice. And why I'm putting this into this conversation is because I think we need to locate molecular HIV surveillance within this type of framework. Is it contributing to the systems of domination that we're familiar with? Next slide. 
And this is just my last one. Here's some recommendations for um, all of us advocates who are concerned about molecular HIV surveillance. I think it's important to monitor your local MHS activities. Um, and one example here, you know, from my own experience is when I learned about this new use of technology in the Seattle area, I actually offered to help um, the health department to think about this and under this type of framework, the anti-oppressive framework, to be able to name the power relations, disrupt the status quo, and center the embodied knowledge of communities of people living with HIV. And um, they've taken me up on that. They're on the call um, with us today. Um, they're really interested in what we all have to say about molecular HIV surveillance. They've invited me to help um, with a manuscript that they're writing about this issue. So I think if we think about working with our health departments and offering to help them think through some of these systems, that may be an area of opportunity. Um, we've also talked about the language of MHS. We can work to help uh, to help all of us decolonize and destigmatize the language. A lot of this is centered around language. And maybe most importantly, I think we should all be setting standards for how molecular HIV surveillance should meaningfully benefit us, communities of people living with and vulnerable to HIV, how it should meaningfully contribute to the ending the HIV epidemic plan. Because right now, we're not really seeing standards set for this. So if we have set standards set for MHS and its meaningful use, then we can hold people accountable to make sure those standards are being met. And that concludes my part of the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian um, and Andy and Barb for that context and framing that I think is really going to help catapult us into the next part of this conversation. Um, which is really hearing from hearing from folks, um, representatives of people living with HIV networks and communities who are most directly impacted. You know, um, many of the PLHIV networks, like we're, we understand that this has been going on for a long time. Um, kind of rolled out in multiple states in 2013, but even before that, MHS was being used in some local jurisdictions, right? And I think in a state like Washington, Washington prides itself on having um, one of the most complete databases of genomic sequences of people living with HIV in its state. I don't remember what the percentage is, but it's quite scary as a person living with HIV to understand that, you know, 60%, 70%, 80%, 90% of like people living with HIV who are diagnosed, our, our sequences are already in these databases. And so um, many of the, um, the, all of the people living with HIV networks, US people living with HIV caucus, PWN and others have called for a moratorium on molecular HIV surveillance until some of these concerns are figured out. Um, until we've addressed the data privacy environment, the legal sharing environment, until um, CDC can guarantee us that this information is never being turned over to ICE in immigration enforcement proceedings, right, for example. So I wanna go ahead and turn this over to our um, amazing panel of speakers here. Um, we're gonna be hearing today from uh, Marco Castro Bajorquez um, from HIV Racial Justice Now, Cecilia Chung from Positively Trans, Larry Scott Walker from Thrive SS, Ebony Turk from Positive Women's Network USA. Um, love to hear your reflections on, you know, what does this mean for our communities? Um, why are people living with HIV raising human rights concerns? And I'll go ahead and turn it over to um, Larry to start us off. Greetings, greetings, everyone. Thank you, Nana, for that uh, opening and everything like that and starting with me. So, <laughs> but um, what this means for us, uh, for me specifically as a Black gay man living with HIV, it's just more kind of the same, the same facilitators that are behind a lot of the mistrust that we have because of the lack of transparency. It's a, uh, more of the same potential of being institutionalized and for what, be being a person who is living with HIV and not only a person living with HIV, but a person who is actively trying to, you know, take control of their HIV. I've said in this conversation, I've said in many conversations and I'll say it in this one, I feel like molecular surveillance kind of kind of assumes that people living with HIV don't want to get to the end of HIV, merely uh, basically because of the way that it's not, you know, uh, we're not educated around it. You know, uh, people living with HIV are not prioritized around, you know, building uh, awareness related to the science, the modality and things like that. So when we find out about it, it feels like the wool was pulled over our eyes. 
you know, and again, there's this, you know, country, you know, uh, making decisions, you know, on our lives, you know, a big a main tenet of the Denver principles was that people living with HIV deserve to have the choice, you know, to have that, their voice heard, their choice uh, honored as to whether or not, as to what happens with our genetic matter and things like that. So uh, again, this feels like more of the same. And when we think about it as the fourth pillar in the ending the HIV epidemic uh, plan, it seems almost counterintuitive, right? Because when I, I talk about uh, this to people living in uh, Black gay men and Black trans people in Atlanta, you know, about this going on, it gives them pause, you know, as a person who had just lost his sister to advanced stage HIV, someone who chose to not, you know, engage in the healthcare system for because of a myriad of stigmas that she faced as a Black woman, as a, a, a potential uh, stigmas that she uh, didn't want to face as a person living with HIV, I, I kind of can't separate the fact that she transitioned due to advanced stage HIV from, you know, the uh, unknowns that she feared as a person living with HIV. And, and, and this is one of those unknowns, you know, feeling like you don't have it, like, you know, just because of a decision that you made to have sex, to engage pleasure, that you've lost autonomy over your body. It's not fair, it's an injustice, and it actually exacerbates our work in this space. It makes our work harder, especially for those most marginalized, those most criminalized amongst us. Thank you, Larry. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call on Cecilia to share with us next. Um, well, thank you, um, Nana. So first off, I want to apologize that I didn't like um, add my slides um, in a timely fashion. So I, um, in the last minute, I asked Andy to add one slide at the end of the slide deck. So like, wait until the end, and you will see what I mean. Um, the mistrust has a lot of like um, origins, but I think that mainly because um, the trans community have been, you know, like in the forefront of like a lot of these kind of like legal abuse. Um, when we look at, you know, sex works, you know, a lot of times, you know, like we're not going to see the HIV criminalization shows up for those who were arrested for solicitations or being, um, criminalized for um, being sex workers because, you know, those are um, called enhancements. So what it does is, you know, like it actually would like reference, you know, the sex workers health record. Um, if there is somebody who's been tested HIV positive and ordered by the court, um, two things happen. One is their status might be announced in an open court, you know, so that everybody knows that their test comes back positive. So that's no privacy there, number one. Number two is that, you know, if um, it shows that, you know, the person actually know their HIV status and continue to be doing sex work, there are still jurisdictions that criminalize that. And it will add, you know, up to seven years of like enhancements to the sentencing. So these are not the things that, you know, normal people will follow, I guess, you know, like, but um, as somebody who's been um, advocating for transgender people living with HIV, especially um, transgender people of color living with HIV, that we know that there has been a really big issues. Um, and it is somewhat invisible because these are not things that we're currently tracking and it's hard to like find data you know like about how many people actually were incarcerated because of um you know like sex works um criminalizations and have the hiv enhancement um and also the other things that i want to share with you is that um we have heard you know like health departments come back and say that these are not going to be like things that they're going to use with like um, law enforcement and i think that one of the first times that you know like we raised this issues with um a meeting that both nana and i was in you know like with the um state um office of aids you know and um but here's the deal um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the site called um, HIV Trace. You know, it's a CDC partnership, and um, and you can actually go to secure.hivtrace.cdc.gov, and you will see a picture. You know that you will see at the end of the slides. You know that it has some really alarming language in there. You know, like it didn't say that. Um, 
like law enforcement cannot use those data. In fact, it says the opposite. And it also has the disclaimers that, you know, like CDC and the federal governments bear no responsibilities to any damage, you know, like um, for, you know, for any like kind of um, usage of this site, you know, like caused by the usage of the site. Um, so, so that's not a way to really build trust, you know, between, you know, like communities living with HIV and, you know, on the, and the government. And the thirdly, you know, a lot of times, you know, like when we look at how, um, how government have been dealing with like public health crisis or not even crisis, like as Andy mentioned, you know, like um, um, the S. STI, for example, you know, like the, the syphilis um, criminalization is one of them, you know, and the profiling of like um, black and brown people. But when you look at people with TB, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that you can read in the news that arrest warrants being issued to um, TB patients who are deemed, you know, like um, contagious to the communities. Um, with the caveat that, you know, like TB, even if it's drug resistance, it's curable. So if they can do that to a curable disease, you know, like imagines what they're going to do um, to, um, to one that has no known cure yet. Um, and that is one of the fear that is really hard to claim, uh, tame. I think that Brian was like trying to speak on the more positive and hopeful side, and I'm presenting the more skeptical side, you know, because of all these things that you can actually Google yourself, you know, like you can Google like arrest warrants for TB patients, you can Google for like HIV trace, and you can Google, you know, the one of the first NIH um, studies, you know, like of Los Angeles that um, um, Andy talked about of trans sex workers, you know, like, and, you know, like the HIV clusters, you know, and that is not a way to build relationship. And I just want to like reiterate that, you know, until they're clearer language, you know, until they can work with, you know, like people with living with HIV um, to better understand how these data are being used it's going to be a problem. And finally, Google CDC website hacked. And you will see that if, you know, like they can get all the data hacked you know, for everything else, including COVID data, what makes them so sure that, you know, the HIV um, um, data is going to be secure. Um, so that's my skepticism. I'm going to close with that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Cecilia and Larry, um, for both of your comments so far. And I think, you know, one of the things that I think is really important for all of us to be aware of is that the um, the, the quote clusters that are being followed and traced most closely, the, these clusters are um, are pe are people first of all, and they tend to be black and Latinx men who have sex with men or trans folks. Um, and so we're, we're talking about, you know, communities that are already extremely vulnerable to various forms of police violence, surveillance, um, being picked up for just walking down the street, um, being harassed by, uh, law enforcement just for walking down the street. These are the same communities that are being literally tracked by these, um, by this technology, you know, across state, state lines, um, we'll try to drop that into the into the chat box. If anyone has the website and can drop it into the chat, that would be great. Um, thank you. I'm going to go to Marco next to share some comments with us as well. Hi, everyone. I have to admit that I was very happy to join all of you today because I think that this is a very important issue. But just hearing my colleagues is kind of depressing. Is the president that is our reality that we have to deal with on top of a condition that really, um, it, it, it really, I don't know. I feel, uh, I, I'm surprised that, I, that I, I know this and yet by hearing this morning, all of you, uh, it was kind of depressing. You know, for me, all of this um, molecular HIV surveillance is, is just racist. Um, we have, um, there is a historical um, legacy of racism on public health, period. And 
And I think that we see in through history how the public health department, um, when they talk about public, is actually white middle age. Um, and how our bodies, our blood have been used historically um, to, for, for experiments. Um, so when I saw the death of people of color due to COVID-19, I re realized that I cannot be nice and careful when I talk about entities like the CDC or, or the public health departments because they have, because they have a, a clear role on the health equity of people and a clear role on the death of many people like myself and like yourself. And so I am done being politically correct about this because it's ridiculous and pathetic that we're here trying to make people, you know, not make them feel bad for something that has cost people's lives. And so I'm gonna say again that for me, um, the molecular service surveillance uh, is a racist a tactic, a, race, a racist uh, policy, and that the damages that causes in communities are actually quantifiable and that are very evident in immigrant communities that have consistently been blamed to bring HIV to the US, which is to totally the opposite. The immigrant people um, typically get HIV within the 10 years that after they arrive here. Um, Immigrant communities have been consistently um, ignored by public health um, when they do like the ending the epidemic, the ending the, the epidemic plans. Um, I remember that that uh, the biggest victory for me to participate in different groups was for the word immigration to be included in a, in a, in a report or something like that. And so I want to say that we often see these the systems and the CDC and, and their policies, especially when they're attached to, to, to money, um, we see them as impossible to disrupt and to dismantle. And I wanna say that that is just a fantasy. That is just, they are, they are actually institutions that we can actually dismantle if we want to. And just like the police, uh, public health um, authorities for me have consistently uh, missing the point to address the important issues of the communities um, that, 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 that need the most help. And so it's upside down, like, you know, it's upside down because, because this, the CDC and the public health departments in the U.S. should be working to support people of color and people that are marginalized, like people that utilize drugs, like people that are transgender, or those folks that are younger. And yet, we see often that all these policies that they enact go against uh, our wellness, our well-being. And so, so we need to speak about this. We have the responsibility to counter the stupid narratives that put, put us, people living with HIV, as um, subjects that, that need to be observed, that needs to be quantified, that needs to be uh, controlled. And we need to address body autonomy um, and to, um, to really uh, hold them responsible for this. The CDC has acted poorly when it comes to, um, to community engagement. And I have asked questions directly to the CDC authorities about, about their, um, will, will, they, uh, will, they, will, will they assure me that, that um, by doing this test, by engaging in this test, that uh, I am not going to be deported and they cannot answer that to me. And so that there, is a, there is so much, um, there, there is so much to, to, um, to point out on how the CDC, um, by rolling out molecular surveillance, have really missed the point to include communities that are actually the most, the most affected by it in the solutions for these. And so I want to say too that the, the, the link to criminalization is, up, is, is also very important because our communities have already been over police, over criminalized, and, and, and underserved. Um, so for me, I think that um, the 
the tactics to actually do these clusters. And when I see that all these clusters are people of color, um, it, it, um, it, it's, it's just difficult to see it because it means that we still live in a racist country and that there is a lot of work to do. And that's why for me, it's important the work that I do at the Asian Universal Justice Now Coalition because we created a framework that you all can actually utilize to include the lenses of racism or race as we do any work on HIV, because I believe that in order to end HIV um, in the US and in the world, we must um, also end racism. And that's my contributions for today. Um, sorry for not being uplifted or uplifting, but this sucks. Yeah, thank you, Marco. Please never apologize for speaking the truth. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ebony Turk from PWN to also share some reflections. Thank you, Nana, and to all the other presenters that have presented today. Um, this conversation, um, all while I was hearing it, my reflections have been um, one of my I shouldn't say my favorite James Baldwin quotes, but one that resonates with me the most, to be black and relatively conscious is to always be in a state of rage when living in America. Um, as, a, as I was thinking about this and the word surveillance, the word surveillance for me means um, death because all of the leaders that have been a part of trying to stop oppression, stop racism, have been killed and killed with a, a vehicle through su surveillance. Um, so HIV surveillance scares the shit out of me as a black woman who is living with HIV that primarily functions in black low income community. It scares the shit out of me. So, um, my community, I, myself personally, um, my blackness has a very um, uncomfortable relationship with the criminal unjust system. And this makes me think that I am gonna be criminalized for um, my blackness and for living with HIV. Um, I live in a state where they consider my black body living with HIV a deadly weapon. So molecular, molecular HIV surveillance is um, not good for me and not good for my communities at all. We know that we can't trust these big, huge systems. Um, we know we can't trust them with our information um, because we know they are inherently racist um, when it comes to marginalized communities. Um, I already have had experiences within the health department system where my information was not used in the way that it should be used. And it caused me to, um, it caused me to not want to seek care. And um, when I heard Larry's uh, story about his sister, my condolences, but I totally understand. I'm gonna tell a quick story just so you guys can see well this is what it brings up for me when i was um i had recently uh, three years after my hiv diagnosis i was i had a i was pregnant and um i went to a doctor's appointment to get a prenatal test and i guess because it was a different um department in the hospital it triggered the health department um and Two days later, this lady banging on my door. I lived in a building. She was banging on my door. And, you know, who is it? And she says her name. And we like, who are you? And she's like, she was like, I am such and such from the Chicago Department of Health. She said it really loud. And we was like, what? And people came out that door. People were looking because people is nosy. So people want to know why the Department of Public Health is at somebody's door. And um, I knew what it was, but I hadn't come out to my family yet. I, my family didn't know I was HIV positive. Um, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to open the door. 
my family looking at me like, why is somebody at the door looking for you from the Department of Public Health? I was like, I don't know, maybe it's something about the baby. But at this point, it's people out, when I open the door, there are people outside looking at her, looking at me. I am terrified. That experience made me not want to go back to the doctor. I actually didn't go back to the doctor for the first three months. And that was not a good thing. Um, so when I hear about this monthly, <laughs> them sharing, um, you know, using this information, when I hear that they won't use um, demographic information, that doesn't make me comfortable because they do what they want to do. The gov big governments, big systems do what they want to do. And when they are trying to target you, they will target you. So um, I have no confidence that um, they won't use this to our detriment. So um, I really, I don't know, it, just even talking about it just angers me so much. These systems are so, um, you know, violent to our bodies, violent to our livelihoods that we have to make sure that we are doing what we can um, to bring this up in our communities, um, to let people know that it's happening. Um, one thing that I thought I was doing right was, you know, I, I said, when I learned about this, I said, I'm not gonna go and um, I'm not gonna let anybody genotest test me now. So they won't be able to share my system, but I've already been genotested tested before. And then when I got to Texas, I learned that they shared, somebody called me from the Texas Department of Health on the phone really loud. And I promise y'all these stories are true. The lady said, do you know, the first thing she said, do you know you HIV positive? Now, of course, I'm, um, I'm, I'm out loud and you know, I'm fine now with people knowing about my HIV status. And we were on the phone, but you don't know who I was in front of. You don't know <laughs> what was happening. And you just say that. So these things doesn't breed confidence for me. It does not say to me that any of this will be okay. So I'm hoping that um, we can make it a priority to bring this up. We can make it a priority to make sure that um, we advocate against this and um, make sure it does not as much as we can, it does not, um, have adverse effects to people getting tested, people getting in care, which, you know, like I said, it, it a lot of it already does. Um, and it is very counterproductive to ending HIV, ending HIV, which is all of the talk these days. Um, so I am hoping that people are working with in their health departments. Thank you, Brian, for that um, suggestion about working within your health departments to let them know how dangerous this can be um, because it is very dangerous. And I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you so much, Ebony. Um, I wanna just take a moment to thank all of our panelists and all of our presenters so far so much. You lifted up really important points. I wanna thank and appreciate folks for sharing pieces of your personal story, family members, um, folks who are close to you. I know each one of you is deeply committed to the communities that we work in. And I wanna, I'm just like so grateful for your leadership and for your willingness to speak up on this issue. And I think, you know, some of the words that are coming up for me after hearing this um, panel so far are just like invasive, violated, intrusive, violence, like we're talking about violence being enacted at the level of our genomic sequences, right? And like uh, folks with HIV, we didn't even know this was happening. Not only did we not consent, we never knew that our data was being taken and used in this way, right? So this is a very, um, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a series of like the nicest way I can put it is missteps um, in thinking about how to roll something like this out. And I just want to very much drive home this point that um, I'm seeing conversation in the chat box about trust. Like, you know, so much of this, like when we look at that care continuum and folks are concerned that, you know, people are falling out of care or are linked to care and then don't come back. Well, we just heard why. So what are we doing to really 
build trust. Trust needs to not be dependent on people. It needs to be dependent on systems. We need to be able to trust the systems. And we can't trust systems that are violating us without our knowledge and without our consent on a systematic basis, right? And so um, when we very directly during the previous administration asked folks at CDC in leadership on molecular HIV surveillance activities, we said, please tell us what you are doing to make sure there are firewalls between this data you're collecting and homeland security and immigration enforcement and border patrol because we understand what is happening to immigrants and we understand that this administration is doing very particular things with immigrants who have quote expensive health conditions too right please tell us what your firewalls are that this data will never be used in an immigration case or proceeding and they said um we don't have you know we we don't have any comments on that we don't have um any um there is no public charge rule in place. Um, and that was true at the time, <laughs> there wasn't a public charge rule in place, but they just declined to answer the question. So these are extremely concerning um, developments. And so we want to get into a conversation with you all about what we can do. Um, and right before we do that, um, we're going to just hear a little bit about what some folks are doing already on, um, yeah, and where, where we kind of go from here. So I'm going to turn this section over to Benjamin Brooks, my fabulous uh, co-chair of the AIDS United Public Policy Committee subcommittee, um, which is working on molecular HIV surveillance. Thank you so much, Nana. I'm gonna take just two minutes of everyone's time because I wanna make sure that we get right to the discussion. Um, I think that there's a real reason that there's a lot of conversation around this is because there's a lot of money being thrown at this, including of course, a lot of political attention that stirred up in 2018 after 45's State of the Union address, um, sort of announcing his plan to end the HIV epidemic, despite the fact that AIDS United Public Policy Council put together an ending the HIV epidemic plan two years prior that had been largely ignored by the administration. Okay. So uh, in 2020, we saw a lot of disruptions to the HIV surveillance and HIV treatment um, and an engagement of community health centers around the world because of COVID-19. In 2021, we see the release of the new um, national HIV planning uh, uh, plan and and coordinated with with the ending the HIV epidemic um, plan, which are two distinct buckets, but but are um, both are supposed to end HIV by 2030, uh, but seemingly without the amount of sort of community buy-in and conversation and trust that that we've noted lacks in the current system, including a, a lack of of an office of national AIDS policy in in the White House. We can move to the next slide. This slide is really just an example of two states that have been doing molecular HIV surveillance. The fourth, I mean, the first, Michigan, seems to be one of those that, that began their early uh, implementation in 2013. This is really just to note the amount of data is massive. They have 11,256 sequences, which I believe are individual people, although I'm not sure. So, so, certain that identified almost 800 clusters. And so what the health department actually had to do was use a bunch of other kinds of, of data in very intrusively trying to understand the actual human interactions that were um, going on here from a systems level approach instead of a community-based level trust approach that, that probably wouldn't have to be as invasive uh, and collect massive amounts of data uh, across thousands of people's lives over over many years. Um, so this is a really troubling set of information um, regarding MHS. And then the New Jersey report is, is a later rollout report, seems to be one of those that was just getting started with the new PS18 grant. Um, and so they are planning to expand legal protection, sorry, planning to expand the legal authority to collect information from people living with HIV. They have a goal to sample all HIV, sorry, to sequence all HIV samples as we've already heard, heard over and over in, the, in this presentation or report. The um, New Jersey Health Department oversimplified the um, transmission without implying, 
without implying directionality. So I'm thankful for Brian for driving that point home that, that there's a large degree of ambiguity in that space. And we can go to the next slide just to finish up on the what the AIDS United Public Policy Council MHS subcommittee has been up to. So we formed in 2019 and in 2020, we um, finalized our recommendations out of the Public Policy Council that that MHS data not be used in any cr criminal, civil or immigration legal proceedings that the federal government prohibit data sharing with a with law enforcement without consent of the individual or without a court order, require states to, to use data protections to get funding from the CDC, to educate the judiciary and legal systems uh, from public health officials to the legal officials on the limits of MHS data, to use advanced anonymizing techniques uh, when reporting MHS data, especially in rural communities, um, and then to enhance and actually practice informed consent for the participation in MHS research, as we've heard over and over again today, people living with HIV are not given the opportunity to have their informed consent for participation in this process. And then to actually disclose the full cost of implementing MHS systems. We don't know if, if this, method is more or less expensive than traditional, less invasive methods of HIV prevention. Nana, I'm going to pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. What a great summary. So um, basically, you know, there's there's a lot of advocacy already underway on, um, sorry, on um, on molecular HIV surveillance. Like this is the, these are the protections that the Public Policy Committee at AIDS United, which is a coalition of like 50 plus organizations working on federal policy have asked for. What this ultimately boils down to is the PPC is recommending that the um, resources for molecular HIV surveillance to jurisdictions be predicated on a set of protections that must be in place at the state level. Um, that is one set, this is one set of recommendations. Another set of recommendations that's been put forward by the people living with HIV networks is that MHS needs to be stopped, um, period, right? At, at least until we figure out all of these issues, which is probably going to take a while. Um, but it must be stopped immediately. And so we do want to hear from you all at this point, um, and always. We want to hear a little bit about what do you know about MHS activities happening in your jurisdiction? Um, any ideas you have on things you can do to raise concerns and what steps we can take to protect our communities from MHS and from these practices? And I want to invite folks to either share in the chat or I think that you can come off mute as well um, and just share any thoughts or reactions you might have or follow-up questions for any of the panelists who have spoken. And if you're not able to come off mute, sorry, um, I think you can like raise your hand or something maybe. I believe we can unmute. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Michael. One thing that that I have not heard made explicit, but it just points to points again to the vulnerability of the community which is most at risk from the use of MHS data. My genomic sequence hasn't been examined in more than 20 years because I haven't had um, a high enough viral load to have a genome, a geno, the, a genomic resistance assay run. So the people who are most highly surveilled in this way are people who are newly and most recently diagnosed. Those are the people that most complete data is avail is going to be available for. And those are also the people who are least likely to insist that when a piece of paper is stuck before them to for them to sign, that they actually read it and are actually uh, giving informed consent. And that that's deeply problematic. Um, the so the the whole issue of informed consent um, 
is is huge, I think. Uh, and and that just highlights in another way why that issue is so problematic. Yeah, thanks so much for raising that, Michael. Um, and I think, you know, the, the bottom line is there's no consent period at all um, for this process. And as you're pointing out really correctly, the folks who are most likely to be caught up, in, you know, in this web of like cluster detection are um, people who are not virally suppressed, are people who are not in care, are people who are more newly diagnosed. And we know that that's, that's going to tend to be a lot of younger black and brown men who have sex with men and trans folks, right? So that, that's who we're really talking about. If you look at any of the data around what the continuum of care looks like, um, that's who we're explicitly talking about. Devin, I see you. I'm going to unmute you. Um, and I'm going to ask folks also to um, introduce yourselves as you're making any comments or raising any questions. I have, yep, yeah, I have Devin next. Thank you, Nana. My name is Devin Hersey, he, him, his, um, US People Living with HIV Caucus. Um, my question is on those recommendations. How are those um, recommendations to be implemented? Is that like um, through CDC or HRSA policy, or are you like recommending a law be changed? Because um, just with my personal research from my state, it looks like um, the use of molecular surveillance for criminalization is in compliance with, um, was it the Privacy Act of 1974? I was just looking for any like legal way to hold this whole mess under control. Yeah, do any of our panelists wanna to respond to that? Yes. Hey, Devin, how are you? Good to see you. Um, um, for me, I think that it's a both and type of situation. Like, you know, I, I remember when I first moved to Georgia and I was receiving care at one of the local health departments, one of the things that the, the, the caseworker made a point to do was to make me sign a piece of paper noting that I had received that and an acknowledgement that I'm a person living with HIV to lay the groundwork essentially for uh, a case to be late, um, a future case to be made against me around HIV criminalization, you know, stating that I did understand that I was a person living with HIV. Why then, not at the point that where we're getting our genomic sequencing done, could there be, you know, uh, any effort or is there no effort to uh, make the person living with HIV know that this is a thing that's happening. This is a, a pivotal time. Now, the, a, a lot of us aren't proponents of genetic uh, sequencing and medical uh, health uh, HIV surveillance because of molecular surveillance because of the, the lack of efforts to make, make people living with HIV aware of that the fact that is going on. It seems like it's it, it's a thing that's happening against us. This is a, a pivotal time where they could enlist us into this process again. You know, if uh, again, as a person who is newly diagnosed with HIV from a community that has the preponderance of, you know, the burden of HIV, you know, I, if you at that point were to say like, well, this is this new thing, we, we're trying to end the HIV epidemic, you know, would you opt into, you know, maybe seeing if you uh, belong to a, a cluster of uh, prioritized people who we want to get tested and to make sure that they're healthy. If people living with HIV could see the actual money that's going into these uh, highly, you know, uh, the, these highly impacted communities and things like that, then I think that it would in, in, engage and, and, and embolden and, and enlist us. But because that's not happening, we know that that's not the plan. You know, we, we feel that that's not the plan. But to answer your question, I think that it should happen, you know, at the beginning stages of getting your care. But also, on, on, uh, there should be policies to, like it was said earlier, to make sure that people living with HIV are protected from, you know, ICE, protected from, you know, uh, being criminalized, you know. And, and I think that the benefits, I know that the benefits of doing those things out far outweigh, you know, this, this, the way that things are being done now, because the way that things are being done now calls for people living with HIV not to want to get tested, to not know their statuses when they're falling ill, to choose to elect death. Just imagine electing to die because you didn't want to potentially, like, I, you know, have your status disclosed on the news before you even get the chance to say, like, no, like, you know, to, to present your case. So I feel like um, it's a both and situation to answer your question, brother. Good to see you. Thank you. And I'm going to um, actually pitch to Benjamin to also address the question about legal 
recourse? Yeah, so the, the question about where the legal change comes from when implementing these regulations, they can come from the federal government and that's the best choice for us because a nationwide standard of protection is a lot faster than a state by state fight. Um, the CDC has some of the capacity and ability to offer what, what would be like rec like recommendations or, or, or guidelines that states can follow voluntarily and most states like to do that because the CDC does pretty good work some of the time. Um, and so the like state legal guidelines for when and how public health data can be shared with law enforcement, that's usually a state by state decision and, and will need to be a state by state fight for like strict laws, but potentially there are regulations that could provide uh, data protections for uh, like national public uh, health data. Yeah, and the one thing that CDC definitely can do within its purview is condition funding to having particular types of protections in place at the state level. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely a lever we can um, consider. I have Chris Wade in the stack next. Thank you, Nana, and everyone. Thanks for uh, allowing me to uh, participate. Um, I just wanted to speak to back in June, uh, June of 2020, we actually held a conversation with our state planning council uh, around this issue specifically. Uh, Coleman Good, myself, and a couple others uh, were involved in the process. And the state really seemed rather dismissive about the whole process. And we really brought to the uh, forefront that, you know, um, people are fearful about going in and getting resistant testing if information is going to be used for other purposes without their expressed, informed, and or authorized consent. And that's been the challenge. Well, the state really pushed back on it and said that the fear really seems to be based on a potential fear of abuse of a test. Uh, however, in Provo, and I'm, I, I'm quoting uh, the state, we can't absolutely rule that out possibility. However, if, did, if it did ever happen, we can say that resistance testing is pretty toothless threat in a court case. It cannot prove a direct connection between two people. It cannot prove the directionality of a transmission. It does not rule out that an undiagnosed person uh, transmitted HIV to the plaintiff. It does not rule out that an unreported diagnosed person transmitted HIV to the plaintiff. And lastly, it does not rule out that a resistance or untested diagnosed person transmitted HIV to the plaintiff. Um, we go on further because we were saying, you know, uh, if folks wanted to uh, exercise some options uh, with resistance, uh, relation to the viral resistance test and viral load testing, um, how would those requirements reflect the Ryan White program? Some of which was, uh, you know, should folks pull out from having their uh, viral load and resistance tests being performed? And they said that those are requirements and that could, cannot be waived by the program. Uh, the other question was, if HRSA does in fact require one or both of these tests to stay in the program, does HRSA ever grant waivers to allow a requesting state to opt out of this kind of requirement? Uh, the response was, not sure what you're referencing, but if you're referencing resistance and viral load test results, program does not waive these requirements. And lastly, uh, some patients may see the privacy benefit realized by declining a viral load and a medication resistance profile. What, if anything, might be the cost, clinically speaking, for the patient? What are the clinical implications of a physician treating a patient without a viral load and a medication resistance profile? Their response, if there are costs associated to resistance in our lab tests, they can be covered by care if enrolled in case management. Again, all clients are required to submit viral load lab results at initial and all subsequent six-month enrollment. These requirements are not waived by the Illinois Department of Public Health uh, ADAP program. So you're seeing that a lot of these folks are basically very dismissive, particularly at the state level, with relation to uh, molecular HIV surveillance. And I think, you know, many of us advocates really felt that, you know, we're paying a cost just for simply getting our correct meds. Uh, and a lot of our uh, biological specimens are being used for things that we've ne not necessarily had any input or say in. So it's been challenging, but I was glad that, you know, many of the advocates, some of which are on this uh, virtual call, have participated in the process and are still pushing the state. Um, as I understood it, I thought the CDC had backed off this process. Thank you for the time. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, a lot of really important information and I think yeah a lot a lot to dive into a lot that's juicy in there to dive into as well um do any of our panelists want to respond with thoughts about what Chris is sharing yeah well I want to Chris I want to thank you for your leadership on this issue too um I think this is something that we definitely need to um figure out how we how we how we can collaborate more, you know, as um, within public health, um, with people living with HIV in the community around really making sure that these systems are accountable, that folks are able to make decisions that really work for them. Um, I don't I know that I definitely have heard from a lot of folks who after hearing about MHS were like, well, I just don't want to get blood work done now. Um, I want to like check out of the system like it where's the underground place to like go get my <laughs> my blood work done you know that it doesn't get reported into the system and go into this like los alamos database and whatnot um so these are these are real concerns in the community and i appreciate the digging that you're doing to um to kind of get some granularity on those thank you Nina, yeah Nina, i also wanted to appreciate chris for 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 his inter for for his his remarks. I also wanted to say that um, I appreciate that because I also know that um, that is a struggle when you think that you're by yourself, that you're alone. Um, I think that um, the other aspect that that I think is, is um, important to highlight is that I don't think that the CDC uh, understands really um, the need for them to actually take it seriously. I don't think that they have taken it seriously, to be honest with you. I think that they don't they haven't listened to us and that is the problem. I hope that we with um some time that we unify our voices so the CDC has no other cho choices but to respond. The way that they have responded so far has been very timid. And and it has responded to people that are actually not do not represent the community at most need. So thank you, Chris, for always being like in the forefront of the struggles. You know that here. In Mexico now, or in LA, you have me as a colleague and as an ally. Thank you, Marco. Yeah. We definitely want you to know that we have your back and really appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you. Um, so I know we are about at time and um, we just wanna leave you with a couple of quick next steps and things to think about. Um, we are gonna try to end the session, you know, really close to time because we know there's other amazing sessions that folks wanna go to and we wanna be respectful of all the other presenters as well. So let me just pitch this over to Barb and Marco to bring us home with some quick recommendations of what we can do from here. Yeah, thanks, Nana. So, you know, as we have been uh, learning and listening around uh, the molecular HIV surveillance and its impact, we certainly want to make sure that we are moving forward with the ending the HIV epidemic plans um, and advocating for changes as listed by Benjamin, as well as listed here around uh, data protection, uh, data sharing agreements, and protections, especially around the structural interventions that um, protect marginalized groups. Uh, Marco, what would you like to add? Yeah, I wanted to just um, maybe start um, pointing out some of these next steps and opportunities. I think that one of the things that is important and what is scary to me is when I think that if by providing the CDC or any health authority um, the blueprint of Mm, perhaps the information that they gather with the HIV molecular surveillance, that they also learn a little bit about my sexual habits or my sexual life, my private life. And I wanted to elevate this. It's scary that the state will know more information about me than other, than other people, like people that are privileged. Um, it's scary that they will have more information on me about um, how do I go about perhaps on my sex uh, sex life, um, and I wanted to elevate it to a human rights um, to a human rights level because I feel that um, we see other states, uh, other places like China that controls the, the population, um, and I think that that um, it's scary to think of potentially what would happen, uh, and so that's why we should not trust the CDC because they haven't done 
great job at keeping uh, our data secure so far. And so we need to demand that they have actually privacy protections and that is called data justice. Bye. Wonderful, thank you. Yep. And, you know, just when we talk about it, we again need to make sure that we're talking about w which communities are most impacted. Our BIPOC communities, our transgender folks are most impacted. So this has not had meaningful involvement of people living with HIV in any way, shape, or form in the planning and implementation, and that our information is being used without our consent, um, and that there is no way for people to opt out of this program. And, so we need to make sure that we continue to talk about this as a human rights um, issue as well. And with that, I will turn it back over to Nana. Thank you all so much. I wanna really deeply thank each one of our presenters and panelists and also all of you for sticking with us for your really thoughtful comments and questions in the chat box. I do wanna let you know also that we are continuing to um, organize a space for folks to raise any concerns that they might have about MHS. Also these questions, you know, Justin raised a really great question in the chat box that we didn't get to dive into, which is how was um, Justin Smith, how was MHS discussed if at all, during your jurisdiction's EHE planning processes. Um, we would love to have those conversations with all of you. And so I want to invite folks to email me. My email address is here on the screen. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in some follow-up around molecular HIV surveillance, what it means for our communities, how we can organize, raise questions at the local and state level, how we might be able to um, come up with some recommendations together to keep our communities safe. And so please do feel free to reach out. We really wanna be in this with all of you. Um, yeah, and also thanks folks for sharing your reactions in here. It is emotional, it is infuriating. It is like, you know, it's deeply personal, um, this, this issue for, for a lot of us. And it's pretty outrageous that these decisions have been made without any community consultation with people living with HIV um, and without you know, seeking input about how to make this work for communities if they were going to do it. So um, I wanna just invite everybody to come off mute for a second and give our presenters some love. Everybody could use some love these days. Um, yeah, everybody is doing what they're doing and we're so grateful for all of your leadership and um, all of your wisdom and sharing with us. So please feel free to come off mute and say a thank you, cheer, thank you. clap a little bit. Thank you all, thank you all amazing. Thank, thank you. you. Much love and appreciation to all of you. Thank you for everything you do every day. Thank, thank you thank for being part thank of AIDS all. Watch. Thank you for being part of our community. As a woman living with HIV, I'm grateful for every single one of you. Thank you. Take good care, everybody, and have a good rest of your AIDS Watch. Peace.